like to ask you a first a basic question. So how did you choose to become a, a pediatric orthopedic consultant? Well, that's, that's um, a, a very interesting, I think, uh, question to ask. And my first comment about why did I do children's orthopedics was that the training process when I trained is entirely different to what happens now. Now, you do your time in medical school, you do some, in, we, in the UK we do what we call pre-registration housework, which is for a year, and then at the end of that time, you basically, I think, got to make a decision as to what you're going to do, and then you go through a protocol of training, um, which uh, lasts between six and eight years, at the end of which you're a consultant. There's no option. Very few people fail the triage, and at the end of it, I'm not quite clear how you've gained the <coughs> information that you've got. Now, when I trained, we did our pre-registration year, and then there weren't any next jobs. You found a job to do. So I found a thoracic job to do, as we, what we call a senior household. And as a result of six months in thoracic surgery, I was definitely, without question, going to be a thoracic surgeon. I attended thoracic society meetings, I knew all the, the things, I knew how to open and close the chest, and this was definitely going to be the thing to do. So that was my first thing, which of course is a long way from children's orthopedics. Next thing, next six months, was in plastic surgery. And the end of which, would you believe, I was going to be a plastic surgeon. There wasn't any question in my mind and the great difference between plastic surgery and thoracic surgery is that plastic surgeons make a lot of money. And I was absolutely broke, and so this was a very attractive op 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 option for me. Well, then there came a very odd dividing point when I was, could possibly have gone to work in a hospital in Bristol or go to work um, at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital. The rotation at Bristol was a very set rotation, which included gastrointestinal surgery, renal surgery, various other things, but no orthopedics. And the, uh, the option that I had to work at Stanmore was to obviously do six months uh, as an SHO in, in orthopedics. Would you believe the RNOH job came out first, I was broke, and so there wasn't any option. So I went to work in orthopedics. Well, then I did find that I really wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon, but I didn't have a thought. I knew that uh, I uh, was going to find the next job, which was going to be something entirely different. So I got accustomed to this idea of what you're doing is what you're definitely going to do. But it did sort of occur to me that this had more opportunities than I thought about before, it was the breadth of orthopedics, total joint replacement was just starting. We're talking now um, about the late 60s, and um, the first joint replacements, McKee was doing his work at, at, uh, uh, in Norwich, and Charlie was doing his work at, in Wrightington, and so this was a possibility, you could clearly see that that was going to be something that was going to be great fun and worth doing. So I ended up, after a certain amount of uh, pause, saying, all right, I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon, and I now want to train as an orthopedic surgeon. Well, now you go to your training program, you get interviewed, uh, you get appointed, and six years later, having got the fellowship, you are an orthopedic surgeon. I uh, was an SHO, and uh, I then became a registrar, which is a sort of halfway, the early part of surgical training. But it wasn't a registrar with a definite program. We went round the place, and I got, a, I got a letter every six months saying that you, for the next six months, you'll go and work in this place. So one of the things I ended up doing was, uh, was driving up the M1 motorway, which is one of the early motorways in the UK, to work at Luton. Well, that was 20 miles north of Stanmore. And the problem with Luton was that it was a perfectly clear thing 
the original M1 had no barrier between the two roads. So people went from the fast lane going one way, slightly sleepy, and to the fast lane the other side of the motorway, and there were these high-speed accidents, and Luton sat on the M1. So they had quite a good resuscitation system, and they were one of the first centres to work out. And as the result of it, the central barrier between the two motorways got built. And that was part of the, the process that happened. Well, of course, I'm now only in training as an orthopedic surgeon. And so the next thing that happened is that I was then looking for a senior registrar job, which in six years of training now is the second half of your training. And I could have gone to Bristol, I could have gone to anywhere where there was a senior registrar job, because as usual, I had absolutely no money. So I needed a job to go to work. And I was fortunate in that the consultants of the Royal National were kind enough to think that I should take money from them. So I ended up as a senior registrar on one of the rotations at Stanley. And this was at the time when the rotations were just beginning to come in. So 67, 68, 69, 70, which was when I was doing those sort of jobs, um, the Stanmore was just beginning to what you now call organised training. And that was, uh, was quite um, uh, a change and we all, I was delighted because for the first time I didn't have to look for a job every year. And uh, being broke, um, I, uh, I, I needed regular work. Well, the rotation at Stanmore puts you around a number of, of places, but fairly early on in the, in the process, um, uh, I went for six months to work at Great Ormond Street, where the current president now works, um, working for a person who many of you have read papers from, but I'm sure none of you have met, called George Lloyd Roberts. And George Lloyd Roberts was one of the, I think, great thinkers of, um, of orthopedics. He, uh, was, he worked and trained at St. George's Hospital, and his thesis, which was what he was going to be in the long term, would you believe, was on osteoarthritis of the hip. And he had a lot of work that he'd done on femoral osteotomies and their uh, place in the management of osteoarthritis of the hip. And we're now talking about, of course, the early 60s, when there was no total hip replacements or anything. So he got appointed against the head at Great Ormond Street to do a specialty that he'd never seen, um, because he had to have a job too. And so he, but the great thing about uh, him uh, was that there were two of them, George Bonnet and George Lloyd Roberts. They were both university firsts. They had double firsts at uh, Cambridge and I think Oxford. And um, they were real thinkers. And so here were two very competent highly intelligent, coming into a specialty um, with, uh, with of which they at that moment do, 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 knew, knew very little. And um, George Lloyd Roberts arrived at Great Ormond Street. Within months, he had started to organize club foot treatments, various other treatments, and he um, contrary to what was going on in the other side of the north of uh, the Atlantic, felt that part of the, the, the treatment of Tartri was conservative. And he had a redoubtable physiotherapist called Miss Tippy. Miss Tippy was about that wide and about that high, and she had hands that I swear are bigger than mine. And these club feet disappeared into her hands and she would feel them about a bit. And after a bit, they came out again looking entirely different shape and were strapped. And the, the correction wasn't held with plaster, it was held with strapping. The great advantage of which is that they could come up with two or three days' time and have some more sort of the stretching treatment and then some overstrapping in. And then once a week, they had the strapping taken off, they had a bath, and you started all over again. Now, 
George knew that plaster was no good, but that this strapping, which he, he learned uh, from uh, Mr. Burns at, at, at George's, was a very good way to go. And it was probably about as successful as um, the Ponsetti method is now at correcting forefoot deformity. It could do nothing for hindfoot deformity, and Ponsetti, of course, divides the tendon Achilles as a routine basis anyway. So there probably wasn't that much difference. And so I arrived at Great Ormond Street, um, very green, knowing absolutely no children's orthopedics at all, um, to be confronted by a very active um, uh, department doing a lot of club feet and some surgery, doing a tremendous lot of DDH and the, what went with it, um, and uh, got sort of landed in, into this, into this um, condition and was absolutely fascinated. So once again, I was going to be a children's orthopedic surgeon. No, I was definitely on the run for that. What then happened, and I commend it to the teachers who all of you are part of, is that I was given a week to find out where the tea room in Great Ormond Street was, and where outpatient was, which wards I was supposed to work on, and the theatres, and that takes about a week because it's a rather complex building. And then I, um, I uh, ended up at this tea with, with George when he said, uh, well, tell me, what are you going to do from research in six months? So I said, well, Mr. Lord, I've never seen any children's orthopedics. Well, Tony, I'm suggesting that you do some work on Perfect's disease. So there it was. Um, I got landed with this project. Um, the, recovery, the, 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 the medical records department at Great Ormond Street in those days was unique because I said that I wanted to see six new Perthes disease to do this project that he'd got on arthrography each week. And at four o'clock on Monday afternoon, after the clinic, six sets of notes and x-rays appeared. So I got this unique opportunity to start thinking about Perthes disease. And we resolved the issue very quickly about whether or not some rather inadequate arthrograms were, were any, came to be any good and came to the conclusion probably that we had to have a better method of doing arthrography, which was fine. But he said, well, you might look at the cases anyway. So over tea, I said to him one day, you know, Mr. Lloyd Roberts, I think that there's more than one type of Perthes disease. And he looked at me and said, well, old Tony, we know that there's half head perfect disease, and they do better than whole head perfect disease. So I said, well, then I, perhaps I could do something else, Mr. Lawrence. No, no, you go on looking. So six cases of notes. And about uh, a couple of months later, I harvested about 60 odd cases. And uh, in the middle of that were these four groups that subsequently got written up. Um, which were beginning to make some sense. And then, so I went to him over this tea party that we had on Monday afternoon and said, Mr. Lloyd Roberts, I, you know, I think I've got a few ideas running and uh, would you be willing to listen to them? Because I'm not sure whether they're better at all. And I produced what are now the four groups and drew pictures of them. And he went very quiet. And then he said, well, you definitely go on. Thank you very much, Mr. Lloyd Roberts. And then once a week he said, all right, what are you doing? And so I had this pressure on me, uh, running and running and running to, to, to get on with this study that subsequently became written up. Parallel to that, we had a paper on club feet. And one of the things that I thought we should do was to learn about the anatomy of dorsiflexion in the normal club foot, in the normal foot. Now, for many of you, that would be a complete set of nonsense because the club foot isn't normal, but it occurred to me that unless we knew how the normal foot moved, then we probably didn't know what the club foot was doing. 
So we did that piece of research, and there was another paper which was much more controversial, which came out of it with uh, Malcolm Swan and Mr. Lloyd Roberts and myself, looking at the concealed rotatory deformities in the club foot and the natural history of dorsiflexion and how these deformities might um, occur. So in a period of six months, I'd become very infected and very um, involved in two major projects, one on Perthes disease, one on um, the club foot problem, and very much involved in the paper that was just being written on the results of treatment of DBH. So I got a sort of handful of children's orthopedics, which I now couldn't get out of, because I'd been away from Great Ormond Street for about a fortnight, telephone goes, go there, what are you doing? So I said, well, Mr. Lloyd Roberts, I've got to, these things here, but next week. And so there was this pressure all the time to be producing these, 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 this work. And um, then at Stanmore, there was the opportunity for the um, various surgical firms to be um, changing it. And as they were changing, I found myself um, repeatedly doing the children's orthopedic bit at Stanmore. And so um, it became natural that that was the way I should go. So I became an orthopedic, sir, a pediatric orthopedic surgeon by chance. Entirely chance. I was going to do something entirely different, but chance put me into orthopedics. I was going to be a total hip doctor, and chance put me at Great Ormond Street and into children's orthopedics. And then I had this <coughs> dinosaur, I suppose is the word, um, of brilliant thinking who um, helped to mould the idea. So George was very much mental. We, none of us knew the answers, but he, what he did was to make you think, and think in a way that you really became involved in how to think about a problem to which you didn't know the answer. Now, if I could just look you all in the face and say, for those of you that are um, not consultants, you will be consultants in within a couple of years. For those of you that are young consultants, and that's young ethos as I hear about it, that's fine. Um, you know all the answers to 70% of the questions. So you know exactly what to do to plant feet. You've heard about it this afternoon. The natural history is that they're all flat. The good news from the last paper is that they all get better. And they get better, as I saw from the thing, at two degrees a year. Now that's very good information because you can look the family in the face and say, your child is going to get better at two degrees a year. And they look at you and say, which two degrees? And you say, well, we'll all get the paper out and read it or something like that. So, um, but the, the problem is that you've got 70% of what you now do, you know the answers to. For 30%, this is a problem which currently, for which you have no solution. And so one of the jobs of a mentor, and I, this is where George really became um, important to me, is that when I hadn't got an answer to a problem, I went to him and said, Ms. Lord Roberts, I've got these x-rays. Well, Tony, what do you think? So he said, well, I was thinking, well, no, that's not the way to think. So what he was doing all the time was teaching me to think. And that's really, I think, the thing that uh, separates the men from the boys, because um, in the, uh, as you become a consultant, a lot of it is straightforward. If you can't do a total hip replacement, you're not in a total hip firm. But everybody can do total hip replacements, and so you can be left to get on with it. One of the questions I might ask, which I do of our group at Stanmore, is, when do you, what are the indications for total hip replacement? So we put up an x-ray and somebody says, well, you do a total hip replacement. So I said, but that patient hasn't got any symptoms at all. You still got to do a total hip replacement? So what we're trying to do is to think. And so the other side of the mentor, and that's on the piece of paper, um, is what should a mentor do? 
And the answer is that I don't think I can teach you anything. What I can help you to do is to solve a problem and to think about it so that you can come up with a logical conclusion which is useful in clinical practice. So if you take Perthes disease, we can take an x-ray and we can think about the pathology of what's going on and whether it's any good. We can think about um, the clinical signs, we can think about range of movement, and we can sort of hypothesize that a joint that is losing movement is likely to be deformed, or to become deformed, and that our object must be to, in quotes, restore that movement. So we can start thinking about how you might restore movement. Now, you've heard some elegant discussions about range of movement in Perthes disease, and I think that's fine. Um, joints that are losing movement usually have unstable movement, and the principle of practice in those cases must be to restore stable movement. And if you take DDH, the hips that go wrong have unstable movement, and therefore what we must do is to work out methods to produce stable movement. And I think that it's those sort of things that the mentor can help you do. I can't teach you anything, but I can go through problem issues to which you don't know the answer, and I probably don't know the answer, but I can begin to think with you how we might solve that particular problem. And so I think that part of the, the problem, particularly as a young EPOS member or a young trainee, is that very soon now you're going to be um, in charge of your own cases and you've got to look after them. And I tell the story that when I was in that situation, I used to have this packet of x-rays and I used to go and have tea at Great Ormond Street. And I used to arrive at Great Ormond Street and George used to say, hello Tony, what you got there? You see, so I said, I've got some x-rays, Mr. Lawrence. Well, Tony, if you've come all this way with those x-rays, then I'd better look at them, hadn't I? Says, yes, please, thank you very much indeed. And um, the, then we look at the x-rays, and we look at them, and say, that's a very difficult problem. And I'm not sure that I know what to do with that. So you say to him, well, I don't know what to do. What should I do? And he said, he used to say very nicely, well, I'll tell you what not to do. And uh, used to say, used to, something he said, I'm, you shouldn't do this. So I said, well, this was, that's what I wondered whether I did. It doesn't work. Well, then you say, well, what should you do? And then he would say, well, should we talk about it? And then we talk about the case. And out of it, from me, through his questions, would come an answer, which of course was all entirely his, but um, I could then do. And so that's really training as it evolves after you've finished your training now. Now, one of my complaints of the present training program is you do six years, you get your fellowship, you end up as a consultant, and 30% of the cases you don't know what to do with. And you haven't got anybody sitting there ready to, 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 to help you because you haven't got a mentor. And I, for some time, pondered whether there should be a, a consultant in the first five years who always spent time with somebody so that they could talk about the problems and resolve the issues. And so I think that mentor is a privilege. If people come to me with an X-ray, I think, right, you know, I remember the time I used to do that, they must think I know something. Well, of course, I don't. But I can look at something and then I go through a thought process and then we can talk about it and I can probably evolve through discussion their thoughts on what should be done. And I think that's the, the job of a mentor and that's the, 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 the problems of being a, a, a young consultant. You know all the answers except there's 30% that you don't know how to deal with. And I think that's the, the problem that you, you need to set out. Now, what's your next question? It was really eye-opener. Maybe we should ask uh, the audience if they have any questions. 
But can we have a mobile microphone for the audience? Yes. Talk out loud and we'll answer the question. Can we have a microphone for the audience, please? I can see Yes, but it's not going to be recorded then. Can you use the microphone, sir? Speciality as a pediatric or surgeon in 1971, the same year which uh, I read your paper about uh, Perth's disease, classification of Perth's disease. And since that time, I'm adopting your classification in my work. I, will, I would like to ask you a, a critical question. What is the, 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 the situation now as regards classification of Perth's disease? and the difference between cataract classification and hearing lateral pillar classification. Uh, still, still, so many, so many pediatric orthopedic surgeons in my country, Egypt, are adopting your classification because since that time uh, I am giving papers and giving lectures about the disease adopting your classification. But so many, so many others say that tell, tell us the difference between this and that and I said I like this I like this classification it works with me but from your point of view what is your opinion about the lateral pillar classification well I think I'd like to to move a little sideways on that because I don't have an answer um, it is to say that if all you have are x-rays all you can get is a classification, because x-rays equals a classification. Um, and I think what we've learned is that we've moved on. If you take um, uh, some global sort of thoughts, if you have a herring A or B or my one and two, by and large they do work. Well. And if you think about it, what one's really trying to do is to analyze why they're doing well. And if you analyze why those cases do well, it is because they retain their clinical range of movement. So these children, maybe having a rather odd x-ray, have an unexpectedly rather good range of movement. So it looks as though one of the more important things as we think about Perth's disease is we can look at an x-ray and it gives us a diagnosis. If it's classically a herring B with two lateral, well, medial and lateral fragment, or my group two, um, or the herring C, a BC, which is my group three, um, uh, that's fine. They give you some generic idea of what Perth's disease is going to do without treatment. Because that's the, the problem. What we have is a condition to which nobody knows the answer. What we want is the natural history of that process, which is what I tried to do all those years ago, to allow people to, um, to uh, decide which ones we're going to do well and which ones we're going to do bad. And you must remember that 60% of untreated Perth's disease get a good result. So we've only licensed to treat 40% anyway and if the one thing that I leave you with this afternoon is a good range of movement, can I um, suggest to you that you very carefully examine these patients because that is the key to looking after a child with Perthes disease. The x-rays help, but we've moved on and what we want is a range of movement and stable movement. And the object of our treatments just in DDH and Perth's disease is to produce stable movement as the child 
stands and walks. And if they can do that without treatment, so be it, and we're delighted. If they're losing movement, or if they're older, then you've got to think again and wonder whether some other form of treatment is necessary. But all that a, a classification can do is to help you to say, well, this one's not as good as a, a five-year-old with group two, and this one is a group four, and we're you know, un unhappy, or this Kerry sees. He says that you can't alter the natural history of those. I think you can, and I think I've got good methods of dealing with that. But if you have x-rays, you have classifications, but what we cannot do and could not do when the work was done was to examine the patients. And clinical examination remains the key thing in our hands to looking after children and making them better. Ma'am. Yes, uh, hi. Um, um, my name is Dalal. I'm a young consultant from Saudi Arabia. Uh, I, I'm honored just to stand in front of you and talking to you. Um, as a mentor, what do you do if, if a complication develops? Um, two months ago, I had a patient who re-dislocated, and I almost killed myself. Um, I know I have a lot of mentors and everybody's around, but psychologically, I almost killed myself literally. So if, if a patient develops a complication, why the, it's either the patient or my fault, whatever it is, so how do you pick yourself up after that? Well, I think one's immediate reaction is, of course, it's the patient's fault. Because they, they, my residence fault. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, no, I think I think the, 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 the we've all been there. I think that's the, the big message, is that the idea that everything goes well in my hands is a completely wrong statement. We've all had these problems, and we've got to learn to think about and deal with the problem. And almost certainly, if you go really go back, it was that you didn't get the pathology of the condition quite right. And one of the, the things that I learned a long time ago now, but we've instituted into practice, is this business as you do a closed reduction of DDH of deciding whether you should add a soft tissue release of the psoas and the adductors. And the more I see of these cases, the more I think that's the way to go. And of course, when you do an open reduction, you're doing it anyway. So there it is. So I think that, and I'm not wishing to interfere with your case, but if this tragedy happened, it was probably that in assessing the case, you didn't quite assess all the variables. And that's what we, I think, need to think about as we go through these cases. Yeah, to clarify, it was, it was a bilateral over reduction. Yeah. And when I did the other side, my resident moved the first side, and they didn't tell me. So I didn't check it until after the happened. Anyways, what, I'm not talking about the, the patient per se. I'm talking about the psychological effects of that. Um, I told you, I almost killed myself just thinking I did something wrong, and I have to take the patient again. Um, is it a, a career changing point or is it uh, something that we have to deal with? I think that the only thing that everybody learns from, from a, a tragedy, I think that's the word, like that, is to think again, as you do another case, the next one, whether you're doing it as it should be done. And so you want to go back to the drawing board, did I get all these bits and pieces right? And. Um, uh, it might have been that it was going to dislocate anyway because something was happening. So I think this is a, a real problem. And we, the, the one thing to, to say to you is we've all been there. But I think the person who's been there and gained is the person who then went back and said, this had dislocated. It seemed to be all right. What did I miss in the open reduction, in the closed reduction, or whatever I was doing? And I always remember one of my teachers, a chap called David Trevor at Stanmore. And uh, I used to say to him, he used to do a lot of revision open reductions for DDH. And um, we'd get in the middle of it and we'd say, you know, he'd have the whole thing open and ready to go. And I used to say, well, Mr. Trevor, is that enough? And he'd look at you and he'd say, well, boy, it doesn't look right yet. Now, I then said to him, what do you mean, Mr. Trevor? Because that was clearly the bit I was wanting the answer to. Well, boy, I don't know. But it doesn't look right. And so I think that's the, the other side of the penny. Some of these people 
can scientifically look at a sub subject and give you the answer. But other people um, say, well, it's not right. And how are you to scientifically look at that? And I remember once we were having a discussion over lunch between a nominal osteotomy and a Pemberton type of osteotomy in the management of an open induction in an older child. Perfectly good thing. So he said, uh, he looked at me over lunch and he said, well, I suppose that if it comes out the front, I do an innominate, and if it comes out the side, I do a, a Pemberton. So I said, thank you very much, Mr. Trump. So we had two cases after lunch. First one, we got into the middle of it, and we put the, the femoral head in the acetabulum and pushed it out the front. He said, there you are, it's an innominate. So I said, thank you very much, Mr. Trump. So the next identical case, same age, same sex, same size, same everything, he put the hip back in and push it out the side and said, we will only do with the pumpkin. So I said, thank you very much, Mr. Trevor. But what I'd taken away from it is that he didn't know that I got to think again, but there was something about going out forward and going out sideways, which was the indications probably for the two operations. And so um, the, the next saga was just after I became the consultant, we had a big combined meeting in London when all the world's great St. Children's Orthopedics were in one room talking about DDH. And uh, we had a series of heart papers, one of which said that the only way to treat it was by an anomalous osteotomy following open reduction, and I think you can probably work out where that came and stayed from. And the next paper was an identical paper with identical numbers, identical results, with a memory lost it. And at the end of it, the gentleman from Toronto took me to one side and said, you know, Tony, I have to tell you that they don't understand. You can't do it in the female. So I said, thank you very much, Dr. Sorter, and we left it at that. But there I had this problem. If I was in the middle of an open reduction, was I going to do a femoral osteotomy? And if I wasn't going to do it, was I going to do it above? And if so, which side was it? Which way was I going to do it? And if you look back in the literature in 2000, you'll find a, a, the conduct of an open reduction, where what we did was to do the test of stability. We worked out that we had a rule of 30s. If you put the hip in 30 degrees of flexion, 30 of abduction, 30 of internal rotation, you could push on the hip, and if it stayed deeply centered, you had a stable, open reduction suitable for realignment. You could then take away the bits and pieces, and I chose to say that if you didn't need flexion, then you could do it in the femur, uh, which we often did, and if you had to have flexion, then you had to have an operation above the hip, and the anomaly was the one to go. But then there were a group of the older acetabular displacers where what you got was a sort of double diameter acetabular. And those ones, I think, were only treatable by the Pemberton type of procedure. So I lived through the, the difficulties. I talked to dozens of people. But at the end of it, the concept of producing stable movement overrode the, the discussion. And we found that if we could get a test to produce stable movement, then we could define the indications for the various procedures. Now, I think nowadays it's all been superseded and people do different things, but this was a, a logical way of thinking through what in those days was a very difficult political question. If you lived in Canada, then you did a nominate. If you lived in London, you did a feminist me, and never the train shall move. And the results, of course, were exactly the same. So and the, the bad news was that we had to sometimes redo the family osteotomies. And there were a group of children, when Dr. Salter was away, who were brought in for family osteotomy, but they were out by the time he came back. So it looked as though there were, the, you know, there were both answers to both questions. Some of them had to have a nominate. Some of them had to have a family osteotomy. And probably in the middle, it didn't matter what the hell you did. And so we tested that, which is that if you're doing your test of stability 
and it's stable without flexion, if you put uh, the hip into about 15 or 20 degrees of flexion and a bit of internal rotation, the hip is completely stable, which is exactly what the anomalous operation does. Um, if you choose to do it below the hip, you could do a femur. So immediately, the, the rationale of thinking, which is what I'm trying to leave with you people, I think becomes fairly obvious. Thank you. Is there any other question from the audience? Yes, please. I have a, a request. It is a suggestion that um, in this circle of friends that we have here, could we um, perhaps have a uh, discussion of challenging cases next year where we can present our maybe our complications in the spirit of trust and kindness and um, um, or our challenging cases where you and your peers could give us some friendly advice? Well, be in the smaller forum. I think it would have to be in a much smaller forum, but I think that the the idea of that is, a, is an excellent one, and of course it applies the mental process of what you really need is somebody like Cambridge who can, or near Cambridge, who can be involved in that. But I think uh, if you write to the reading committee, because they are the program committee, they will decide when, whether anything can be achieved that way. But it's a very logical thought process. Um, I think the problem is that everybody will have a different solution and come away more confused than the West. <laughs> that was actually my intention, was to find out six ways of skinning the cat. Yeah, that's right. Well, a, a cat usually hangs by a tail, isn't it? Uh, behind you, Madam, there is another question, please. Vito Pavone from Italy. <coughs> it's an honor talking to you and listening to you. My question is, among your large series of papers, which one do you consider your masterpiece, the one that gave you more satisfaction, and why? I, 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 don't, I don't think I can answer that question, because it depends on when it was written and what I was interested at in the time. Because at the time, we were doing things that I thought were very important. And so, perhaps one of the things we did was to publish a... We set up a classification club feat, and we designed a a small operation done posteriorly which would improve what we call the tendon contracture children. And at the time I thought that was quite an important contribution. Now it's as usual superseded and everything that I thought was important is erroneous. But that's time and we all have to change. is worth asking. The, the answer was that I worked out the, the classification, but as I looked at the, shall we say, group three cases, there were some that did very nicely and some that didn't. And so, applying my thinking process, I started to look at what was the common features to the ones that didn't do well. And I came up with the concept that we now call the head of risk, which I think has stood the test of time, and of course is independent of classification. And uh, the other thing that I think to say about the head of risk is that that has evolved over time so that I now talk much more about range of movement and progressive loss of movement as being a very important indicator of head of risk and to a lesser extent about the radiological signs because I choose to believe that examining the patient gives you the answer. Ms. Uh, Ketrell, Michael from the Zona from Holland. Um, talking a little bit more on losing range of movement. Um, if you lose range of movement in a child with Curtis disease, losing internal rotation and uh, losing abduction, most surgeons still would try and do uh, fer fer ferrizing or surgery trying to get a better contained hip. But this is contradictory to what you're saying now. No, I don't think it is at all. I, what I'm saying is the natural history of the untreated disease of progressive loss of movement is to progressive head deformity. What I choose to believe is important is this, what I call the dynamic arthrogram, 
where you put the, some dye in the joint and you watch the hip move. Now, some of the cases we're talking about, as you try to bring them in abduction, they hinge. The, the middle of the head hinges on the lateral lip of the acetabulum. And that is not uh, a, a suitable operation for a varus osteotomy or a nominate osteotomy because you've got an uncontainable hip. Whereas if you put some dye in the joint and the, as they move into abduction, the, the, the leg centers, the hip centers, and particularly if you look at the hip in the neutral position and rotate the hip <coughs> in the neutral ad and ad abduction, you'll find that as the, the, um, the femoral head rotates, instead of rotating in the socket, it rotates. And that's unstable movement. And then as you bring the leg into a bit of abduction and a bit of internal rotation, suddenly the type of movement changes from this to that. That is your position for realignment, and which way you do it, I'm not the slightest of it. So I think that, I think that uh, what we're trying to do is to achieve stable movement, and I think that's best demonstrated or thought about with what I call the dynamic offering. Could I ask one more question? Uh, people say sometimes that the necessity to do surgery needs to be done in the first year of person's disease. Probably in the first year, the loss of function is not there or not so apparent as in the next years. No, but I think you've, you've got various, we now need to go to the natural history. We know that the 10 year old presents early with a painful, moderately stiff hip, sometimes with a bit of fixed abduction, often with a fixed adduction position. And we know that those cases are going to do badly. And there were papers that put my head at risk and correlated them against age and showed that the child over eight was progressively deteriorating with regard to the at-risk concept. And so I think those cases you take over. Whatever you're going to do, you should do and do it now. Um, because you know it's going to go wrong and the best chance for good long-term remodeling is before the femoral head seriously collapses. And so for these older ones, we did an innominate, we did a, a lateral shelf, because that seemed to be a better procedure than the femoral osteotomy, which always left a, a residual coxa vera, or the innominate, which doesn't really control the state of stability of the movement. So, Dr. Wahi, I'm from Armenia. The first, I want to say thank you very much for this opportunity. So my question is, um, Intel philosophy question. So from after a lot of years of work from point for uh, uh, from for uh, I I think for all of us it's very important your uh, advice for us. So uh, from other side we have guidelines which is changing every year so a couple of years. From other side my question is so for you now, which is more important, guidelines or knowledge plus individual doctor philosophy plus and for decision making for the treatment? Well, guidelines are fine. Um, you know, you don't have to think. It's the logical example of the transmission of information through the eyes and ears to nowhere in particular and out through the mouth. It, it's, a, it's, not a, um, it, it's not a way of thinking. You just have your guidelines and that's the way you do it. You do it without thought. And perhaps the message I'm trying to leave with the assembled company is that every case should have your positive best thought put into it. So you may say, I'll take this guideline and I'll see if it will fit to what I think should be done in this individual case. If it does, the guideline's fine. But you'll hear, I think it's tomorrow, that people are comparing guidelines and algorithms with simple hip, abs hip aspiration, which is better. And I think the conclusion is the algorithm is hopeless, but the, the, the hip aspiration gives you a, a result straight away if you look at a gram stain and within 24 hours for a primary culture. So maybe it's the better way through, but it's not on the algorithm. So guidelines are fine, you've said, which absolutely is true, that they change all the time, 
And my question is, if they're changing all the time, then they're not really worth the paper they're printed on, are they? I think you're better really thinking about a case, talking to a colleague, saying, I've got this problem, ESR is fine, but the CP, um, the CRP is 150, um, do I have to open this hip joint or can I just aspirate it? Now then you can have a discussion. Or you may wish to consult the literature. Thank you very much. The question lies uh, because uh, today we heard and we saw some paper and the people lengthening the leg and the uh, healthy person 162 centimeters and which is, believe me, it's, for me it's something, you know, I don't know what is this. This is can, some, can, some kind of philosophy. Can, can, can I say I don't understand that? We can talk till morning, I think, about this. Uh, Federico has a final question to close the session. Just a quick question. So, if you can ask if it's uh, still worth it doing pediatric orthopedics today, and to a broad, uh, to a larger extent, uh, is it still worth it to go into academics today? I, I, I mean, the answer is that you do what excites you. I was excited by the concept of trying to think about Perthes disease, DDH, and club feet, and ended up being a children's orthopedic surgeon. The problem, and I speak now for the UK in particular, is that the ground work has changed. We all have to meet targets. Patients are very expensive and should not be in hospital. I mean, if the managers had their way, they'd close all the beds because it would resolve the financial problem that they're in. So we're looking, and I don't question this, I think it's very good to look at better ways of caring for patients. And I remember that when I was a clinical director and looking after a big section of the hospital at Stanmore, they came to me and said they'd either got to close a ward, get rid of 20 nurses, or um, I would have, couldn't go on as a clinical director. So I said, well, why, why can't we make some other changes? And they said, well, what other changes can we make? So I said, well, we could re reduce length of stay by two days. Well, oh, that would save all the money. So I said, yes. Well, do you think you could do that? Yes. So we instituted a, a, a business of early discharge following joint replacement and various other things by which a consultant didn't have to come round and send a patient out, which is what previously had been happening. Um, we, uh, we had a set of rules for when the total hip replacement could go home. When the nurse said they fulfilled the rules, they could go. And very often, because we were in the ward, the nurse would say, I think that patient's ready to go. Could you agree? And I would go and ask. And off she went. So there are other ways of doing it. But I think the problem now is cost. And we're all facing this terrible problem of cost and high volume of patients, all of whom have got increased demands. Now, that mainly children's orthopedics are very unworthwhile um, subject. I choose to think it's probably not true, but um, certainly if you're a sports medicine person, um, you, you know, because all of this is going on, short length of stay, um, they could have the opportunity to make tremendous sort of money. Um, I'm not sure that that's why we're in medicine. I think we're in medicine to care for patients. But I do think that we've been very staid in not being very critical of whether we're doing it the best we can. And change on that process, I think, is absolutely to be uh, encouraged. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Mr. Cattle. This session was videotaped.